Good morning, everyone. My name is Wei Chang. I'm from MCBOP Public Center. Uh, my advisor is Professor Steve Nutt. Uh, my topic today will be carbon nanotube reinforced polymer nanocomposite, engineering the interface at the nano domain. Uh, first, before I go into the details of my research, I would like to clarify several key points. First, uh, what is composite? Composite material is a material that is composed of the matrix and the, the reinforcement. Mm, matrix surrounds and supports the reinforcement, and uh, while the, the reinforced material, uh, they, they, provide, they provide additional uh, physical properties to the uh, composite material. As you can see over here, this is a tomb painting in the Egypt tomb that depicting the uh, brick making in the ancient times. Actually, the bricks are made of mud and uh, straw, which is uh, the a primitive form of uh, composite material. Well, you can see over here on the right hand side, it's a, uh, it's a state of the art um, uh, called Global Hawk. It's an unmanned uh, aerial, aerial vehicle, which is made by Northrop Gump. Uh, Northrop Grumman Company. The the fuselage of this uh, plane is made of carbon fiber reinforced polymer composites. And uh, today my topic will be the uh, nano composites. So the the reinforced material I'm going to use here is the carbon nanotubes. The diameter of these um, nano fillers will be around the range from one nanometer to a few hundred nanometers, depends on the number of walls they have. And uh, the, the lens of these uh, nanofillers will be uh, ranged from a few micrometers, uh, tens of micrometers to a few millimeters. Uh, as you can see here, the Young's modulars of these carbon nanotubes are in terabascal range, while the, the density of these carbon nanotubes are just a fraction of uh, the steel. So uh, carbon nanotubes, because of their high aspect ratio and uh, their superior mechanical properties, they are considered an ideal reinforcement for composite materials. Uh, here is a, a list of a few challenges in this field. First, it's the dispersion uh, of these nano fillers in, into the resin system. Because uh, as most of the nanoparticles for single wall carbon nanotubes, because of the bundle wall force between them, they usually form in bundles. Uh, in the literature, uh, fluorination has been employed successfully in order to disperse these uh, single wall carbon nanotube bundles into smaller bundles. While for multi wall carbon nanotubes, they can form fractal uh, agglomerations in different solvents, uh, which the size of these agglomerations are governed by the second law of thermodynamics. Um, as uh, in the field of composites, it's very important to align fibers so that you can, you can design uh, materials so that you can uh, maximum the, the reinforcement power in, in certain directions. So actually, the alignment of the nanotubes has been a perplexing issue for a lot of researchers in the field. Until last year, in August, a, a paper was published in Science. It was found by a few engineers and uh, researchers from Texas Dallas. They, they actually they grow on these uh, carbon nanotube forest first on a substrate, and then immerse these carbon nanotube forest in an uh, aerogel, and, and uh, the, the, the whole thing was uh, pulled, up, pulled out. Uh, because of the shear force, um, these nanotubes were automatically aligned into these kind of uh, transparent unidirectional uh, carbon nanotube reinforced sheets. So uh, thirdly, but by no means, the, the, the last one is the interface of uh, these kind of uh, nanocomposites. As you can see here, the, these uh, nanotubes are pulled out from a polymer polymer matrix. There's a thick layer of uh, 
uh, interface polymer, which is attached to these kind of nanotubes. And uh, as we can see over here, uh, for traditional carbon fiber reinforced uh, composites, the, the fraction of interface polymer versus the, the fiber volume fraction uh, goes like this flat line. Well, if for the, the fiber size goes to nanometers, the fraction of the interface polymer would go exponentially shooting up. And uh, so how, how, how should we um, solve the problem of, of dispersion and how can we build a reliable and uh, good interface in order to transfer stress in these kind of composites? Here is a slide of for some of the old research I did in the Composite Center. Um, we utilize a two-step functionalization process to do some surface modification of these kind of carbon nanotubes. First, we mix carbon nanotube with uh, a uh, acid mixture, so as we can activate these carbon nanotube and introduce uh, carboxylic group onto its surface. And uh, secondly, we have an uh, esterification um, reaction so that we can attach uh, epoxy group, um, hydroxy group onto the surface so that it will be compatible to our resin system, which is uh, EPON828. As you can see over here, uh, the solubility changes um, for different species of carbon nanotube. It's obvious for these two um, surface modified carbon nanotubes, they can solve very well in, in our EPON828 system. And uh, in the middle of this graph, it's a TGA uh, test result um, from, uh, I mean, thermogrammetric analyzer. From this graph, we can calculate the, this, this around 1% of carbon atoms at the surface of nanotube are uh, attached to the carboxylic groups. While the conversion rate into uh, sec our secondary species range from 20% to 55% according to the, this uh, TTA data. And uh, the, our FTIR test uh, spectrum also confirms the attachment of all these uh, polymer chains onto the surface of carbon nanotubes. So uh, here's a few results. Uh, then we, we, we mix the modified carbon nanotubes with that of the EPON828 system. We use uh, high, high shear mixing along with the uh, ultrasonication method. And uh, we also use a triamine uh, hardener to do a uh, in situ homopolymerization process so that we, we, we can make a very rigid epoxy coupon. Using these coupon, we, uh, we did some uh, micromorphology anal analysis to use TEM and SEM. And uh, we're also utilizing the thermal dynamic testing uh, machine to do some um, TGA, uh, T DMA test on these samples. A four point bending test were also uh, performed on these samples. So, what we found is that there's a significant improvement of flexural strength uh, without sacrificing the elastic modulars for these kind of uh, modified carbon nanotube reinforced samples. While for those uh, carbon nanotube without any modification, we found actually a deterioration of the mechanical properties. Uh, the underlying reason lies in first, uh, uh, for those modified carbon nanotube, we have um, very well, they are very well dispersed in the polymer system. And secondly, uh, at the surface, at the interface, they form a covalent bond so that they can uh, the stress can be effectively, effectively transferred from the matrix to the fiber itself. And uh, in addition, these nanotubes, when they are included into a polymer matrix, they serve as obstacles to those uh, uh, brittle cracker propagation so that the, um, so that, uh, the, the, the failure mechanism changes according to these two SEM features. However, uh, there's a few remaining issues. For example, during the uh, oxidation, we, we introduce a lot of defects onto uh, the carbon nanotube surface. And uh, if 
in the secondary uh, reaction, we found these uh, carbon nanotubes that actually they are, they are, the aspect ratio have been greatly re reduced. And uh, secondly, um, the, the, the esterification reaction is slow and the, the conversion rate, uh, conversion is not that, that high. Um, we also employed a, a range of uh, different uh, imaging techniques to look into our sample. We found, although uh, we call these a uh, well-dispersed sample, but there's also still um, sub-micron size agglomerations in those well-dispersed samples. So uh, what I'm doing now is that I'm trying to do a chemical modification or physical modification on these multi-world carbon nanotubes, uh, either using a three-step chemical treatment or a surfactant method. In, in the first scheme, this three-step functionalization, fu functionalization process, uh, we first we, we, we use the oxidation method as we did before, and uh, later on we use uh, lithium aluminum hydrate to convert these miscellaneous groups that incurred during the acidification process back into the uh, hydroxyl groups. These hydro, uh, when, when these uh, miscellaneous uh, functional groups are transformed into hydroxyl groups to reduce the surface tension of these nanotubes, and uh, they also, you know, induce less side reactions in the system. And uh, um, these hydroxyl groups uh, actually can react with uh, a whole range of regions and. Uh, uh, we can base our secondary reactions on a whole reaction system based on hydroxyl groups. And uh, for example, uh, we can react the hydroxyl groups with uh, cyano uh, thionyl chloride. And later on, we can also employ the reverse um, atom transfer uh, radical polymerization uh, to develop uh, these surface groups so that we can have a uh, well-controlled surface group, we can control the length of the polymer chains that, that will be attached. In the second scheme, we are using a polymer wrapping uh, physical bonding. Uh, the, 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 this PAH is a surfactant we use. This surfactant we have, will, will have a wrapping effect on the uh, surface of carbon nanotubes. And uh, this surfactant also introduced uh, um, periodic amine group, uh, amine groups into, onto the surface of carbon nanotube. These amine groups later on will, will re react in with our resin system, which is the EPON A to A, so that it will also form a covalent bonding. Uh, the motivation for my current study is that um, we need to reduce the surface defects and uh, prevent, preserve the integrity of carbon nanotubes. And uh, by combining with uh, a whole array of uh, macromolecule chemistry, we can have a better control of the uh, surface species. Uh, specifically, for example, we can control the length of uh, the molecules attached to the carbon nanotube surface and the functional groups. And, uh, um, for both of the two schemes, a uh, three-phase model, which is the polymer matrix and the nano inclusion and the interface, uh, can be employed to elucidate the properties of these uh, nano composites. Actually, I've been doing uh, some literature survey in the in various models of composite uh, theory. However, most of the composite theory uh, they they do not include uh, this uh, interface uh, into their model readily. Even if for some of the model have, you can you can treat these interface as the additional reinforcement phase. However, the the shape of the interface, the the, the interface polymer, uh, is not uh, not not well quantified. For example, in our system. Uh, these, these interface of polymer can be regarded as a network of uh, hollow, hollow tube of uh, interface polymers. So um, later on in my research, I also plan to include the 
the effects of the diameter, uh, the length distribution of these nanotubes, the orientation and the uh, agglomeration of all these carbon nanotubes. And uh, thank you very much for your patience. Then any questions? The uh, nanotube uh, that you're using, uh, density appears to be relatively low. Is it a pretty porous uh, material? Is, is the nanotubes that you're using, you mentioned that the density is 1.3 or 1.34. Uh, actually, uh, the one I use is a multi-wall nanotube. If it's 1.3, it's single wall, but for the nanotube I'm using, it's like the 2.3 or 2. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know how, how do they quantify the density of these tubes, it's just uh, some data. Could you explain your TGA? Uh, you had a slide on TGA, I'm not quite sure if I followed, yeah. Okay. What's the significance of that? Uh, okay, it's uh, called the thermogravimetric right. analyzer. Uh, these data actually, these, these are the, on the right, uh, a vertical axis, it's, uh, it's the weight. On the horizontal axis, it's the temperature. So basically, you heat your sample in a chamber. Um, the chamber is con atmospherically controlled. So you, when you heat the sample, you have a weight loss. You can monitor the weight loss of these samples. By monitoring these weight losses, you can, you can quantify the weight of the polymers that you, you are grafted onto the surface of the That's the weight case. loss of your polymer? No. Yes. Okay. What, why in one case are you continuing to draw? Uh, which case? Yeah, that one. Oh, this one? Uh, actually, actually, we take uh, this 600 at, the, uh, at this point, we take the weight loss of the polymers. But when continuous to job, it means that actually the, these uh, these carbon nanotubes, uh, you know, because they suffer uh, during the chemical treatment, they, they have those surface defects. So actually, they uh, they are losing weight. So, but actually, the, the data point we take uh, over here, we, we quantify this 600 point as the weight loss um, of okay. these polymers. Any more questions? Any more questions? Yeah, follow up. So in that graph, what's your conclusion? What's the difference between the four samples? Oh, um, well, what is the color? Uh, for the multi-wall top nanotube, because um, it, it have if it's not surface treated, it have really good uh, thermal stability. But for the, these these uh, surface treated. Uh, you can see there's weight loss, but these weight loss are contributed to the, uh, the, the, the decomposition of the surface molecules. So from this weight loss, we can calculate actually how much uh, uh, surface molecules we have grafted onto these carbon nanotubes. So my con our conclusion is that uh, for these, uh, during the first uh, stage of uh, the nanotube, carbon nanotube treatment, we have around 1% of the carbon atoms at the surface of these carbon nanotubes are attached to the carboxylic group. Uh, during, the second, <coughs> during the second stage, we, we can calculate the conversion rate of for the secondary reaction. Thank you. Any more questions? Then let's thank Wei Wang.